is the word of God high with me? Say this with me. This is my Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path and hide its words in my heart that I may not sin against God. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come prepared uh, to receive the message you would have from us from your spoken word that's been written to all of us and preserved throughout the ages, may we be ready to receive exactly what you need to speak to us today as we study the Church of Philadelphia. May we be filled with love. May we be filled with faithfulness and may we be motivated to serve you until the end of this age or until you call us home or until you come back to get us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, finishing up, we're talking about the churches of Revelation. We'll be in the Church of Philadelphia in chapter 3 of the book of Revelation today. Before we do that, let's do the backdrop that we've been doing. So we have these seven churches that God has given us that Christ has written these love letters to. Sometimes he's had to say some harsh words, but he, he usually tries to compliment every church. He also has some commands and criticisms to the churches, and then he has consequences that he gives us that are good. Like, if we do this, I will bless you in this way. If you don't do this, this will be the consequence that you will reap. So all these seven churches are timeless. They literally existed. The Church of Philadelphia existed from the moment it was created in the first century into the 14th century, until the Muslims invaded and took it over. That's 14 centuries. Imagine a church that lasted 14 centuries. Wow, that's pretty amazing. The Church of Philadelphia did that. How did they do that? They were faithful to Jesus Christ. They are going to be one of the two churches that Jesus has no criticism about at all. Only two. Lexington Park Baptist Church, that should be our desire. To have Jesus look at us someday and have no criticism. To have Jesus look down upon us and say, you have done what I've called you to be in the generation that I raised you to be here, and you are a glorious church. You are my bride. I am proud of you. That's what we want Christ to say about us. I want to say some of you, I've been challenging you. You know that in two weeks, I'm preaching a sermon based on the information that you give me. I have received two responses so far on letters of what you think Jesus would write to us. Now, you can follow the back of your program. You can go and you can follow this. I know your works, but I have this against you, therefore you must. And if you do not, you can follow the same pattern the scriptures does. Give a description of how Jesus will describe himself. And then go through, what, how would Jesus compliment us? How would Jesus maybe criticize us? Maybe there's something. And by the way, somebody wrote something that's so profound that I'm, I've already got one of them that I already know that's going right there. It's a great criticism. It's not a bad thing, but I'm going to go ahead and give you a prelude. It's, it's that we don't believe that God wants to do great things here. We can change that, can't we? Man, I've been preaching on that for four months. Come on, you guys. The great I am wants to do great things. we got to believe it. All right, so also go down there and say, what would God command us to do? What are some specific things that maybe God wants us to do in this community right here, right now? What are things that God would command us to do? And what would be some consequences? What would be some things that would come if we do those things that he commands us? If we live out as he's called us to live out, what would happen as a result? What blessings would we receive? I want everyone to get on board of this. I want you, don't send me all the letters at the last minute and make me have to comb through it and make a sermon. Don't do that. That's not fair to me. But give me enough information to where I can compile them together and make a message to our church of what the Spirit would say to us if Jesus wrote a love letter to us. You know, look at it and look at it and be honest. I'm not asking you to, you know, you may know some criticisms. By the way, some of your criticisms are not going to make it to the list. All right? So don't be negative. Be as positive as you can. But if there's something that you think God would criticize us about, do it. If there's something we're doing right, compliment us. Jesus did that to the seven churches. And these seven churches stand for seven different time periods of church history. The one we're going to talk about today would come after the Reformation. Last week, I preached in the church of Sardis. And we know that the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, came out of that time period. There needed to be an adjustment in the church. So God birthed the Protestant Reformation. Also at that same time period, God gave us the word of God, listen, into the people's hands. The good thing, I don't, King James Version is not what I preach out of, but the good thing about the King James Version is this, you guys. It got the Bible into the hands of common folk. Amen? 
And that is what we need. Today, do you know that if you say, I don't understand that, you can go get a translation you understand. There's no excuse not to read the word of God. There's not an excuse to say, I can't figure that out. I don't understand it. You live in a day and time where you have access to God's voice. You. You don't need to go through a priest. You don't need to go through a rabbi. You don't need to come to me. You can read it, and the Holy Spirit can guide you. That's an amazing thing. So what we have is we had, remember, the church became, they started to capitulate. They began to compromise. Sound like us today, too, maybe. Then they started to, what, have corruption within. And then finally we had the purging last week when we talked about the church of Sardis. And now we're going to talk about the church that emerges faithful. That's the church of Philadelphia. This would have been around the 1750s up to modern day is what time we're going to talk about. Who knows what happened in the 1750s? There was a great movement that began for out of the Protestant Reformation that came about 17 to 1800. Who knows? There was great awakenings in America, but beyond that was the missionary movement, starting with William Carey. It has motivated us even to this day. Did you know that Southern Baptist Convention, Southern Baptist Convention sends out more missionaries than any denomination on the face of the earth? We don't send out enough. Do you know that David Platt is asking that we send out thousands more missionaries. But this last year, because of finances, they had to release and let go thousands of missionaries. We know that there's more work than we can do. There's still more work that needs to be done. Even with us having thousands of missionaries that we send around the world through the International Mission Board, we still cannot send the gospel to every region of the earth. Wow, that just mystifies me. But what we're going to see through this missionary movement if we, as we look at Philadelphia is there's some key things that happen. One, the word of God is in written form. We can now translate things in what? All languages so that every tribe, every tongue, every nation will know that Jesus Christ is Lord. We can now start to do that. Transportation starts to improve. Now, I know you're thinking about taking a boat 30 days over the water that would have been safe. But now look how fast we can get information at a click of a button. So information flow, being able to communicate. But the missionary movement advanced because the church was able to appoint missionaries that would go to the ends of the earth. And that is the Great Commission. So what we see in the Church of Philadelphia is a church that is sold out to take the gospel to every region on the face of the earth. That is a mission, Lexington Park Baptist Church, that we have. When we partner with the Southern Baptist Convention, we are saying we want to see missionaries go to the ends of the world. Also, I want to challenge you this. I believe greater than that, I believe each and every one of you is a missionary. Something that we've lost in our churches is we keep thinking about giving money to missionaries. Okay, I gave my money to Lottie Moon and, and Annie Armstrong. If you don't know who they are, you should, but that's all right. If you don't, that's okay. They're missionary givings that we give specifically to either North American mission boards or international money. And what they go, we think, okay, I've done my job. Well, that's not what God says. You are on mission wherever you are at. Where you live, where you work, where you play, where you shop, wherever you go, you are a missionary for Jesus Christ. Yesterday, I wish I could you know, duplicate myself and I could have been at the Good News Thing and I could have been at that Walk for Life for the Care Net and I could have been at the, at the Great Mills Band Thing. I had to go to the Great Mills Band Thing and guess what? I was a missionary there. Guess what? Some of you that went to the Good News Club, you were a missionary there. Some of you that went to the, the Care Net walk thing, you were a missionary there. You are a missionary wherever you go. Everybody go ahead and say, I'm a missionary. I'm a missionary. You are now appointed. <laughs> now going to the ends of the earth, you are the new William Carey. You are the new person that's supposed to take the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere you go. That's what this church did. The greatest compliment Christ can give this church is you have been faithful to my gospel. So let's read the word of God. Let's open to Revelation chapter 3. Starting in verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write these words. The words of the one that is holy. The true one. The one who has the key of David who opens and no one will shut. Who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you a door that is open, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word, you have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews but are not, they lie. 
Behold, I will make them come and bow down before you and your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world, or try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. May God add a blessing to his holy word. So look at, look at this. How is Jesus presenting himself? So if this is true, if this represents 1750 to modern day, and the next week's church, Laodicea, also represents modern day. What we're going to see is two things happening. We're going to see a church that's faithful and a church that's lukewarm. We need to determine Lexington Park Baptist Church. Are we going to be on fire and faithful to Jesus? Or are we going to be lukewarm for Jesus? Are we going to do like a lot of churches in modern day history where we straddle the fence and we decide, well, I go to church on Sunday, I can do whatever I want the other six days. Are we going to say, well, maybe I'll give Wednesday. Maybe I'll sign up and I'll do one day at the county fair. I mean, that's all I really need to do. You know, maybe, maybe we'll say, you know, look, you know, at work, that's work. My politics, that's politics. My, how I, what I buy with my own money, that's what I do. Jesus never told us to compartmentalize our life. In fact, when you come to the cross, it says you must die. You must die so that you can take up the cross and follow Jesus. And if you die, that means you give everything up. I'm telling you, I've done a lot of funerals. I have never done a funeral where they are driving a U-Haul behind the hearse. Never. You will not take it with you. The ways of the world will never get you into heaven. Only Jesus Christ. Not your family. Not a church. Only Christ. So let's make sure that our lives are focused where they need to be focused. And what he says here, he goes, listen, I'm the holy one. I am the true one. Jesus is defining himself for us in two ways. One is this. He's holy. He's set apart. Guess what? He says in Peter to us, you are to be a holy people. Do you know that you're supposed to be holy like God is holy? I know that's kind of that's hard for us to gather because I know all of you, if you, at least if you're like me, I'm thinking... You know, God, you remember that thought I had or what I said the other day or how I treated this person the other day or, or whatever I've done, and I, I'm a dirtbag. You know, in comparison to you, Jesus, I can't, I can't stand in your presence. Christ is not asking us to do that. Holy means that we are set apart from the world to be used by him. It doesn't mean perfection. Now, holiness should have, imply some purity and cleanliness, but what it implies is that we're set apart. So Jesus is saying, I am holy, I am set apart, I am different from the world. If you are going to follow Jesus, you have to determine in your heart that you and your lifestyle and the things that you do are going to be set apart from the world. And I should have amen thundering in here for that. Every one of us, that's going to be a prayer that we should have every day of our life. I'm going to be different than the world. The other thing is Jesus defines himself as the true one. Truth. Listen, we live in a day and time where they don't want the truth. In fact, we will believe lies and think it's okay. I mean, every day you watch, and you can just watch on TV, and there are lie after lie after lie, and we believe it, or who cares, or whatever. Jesus says, no, truth matters. I am the true one. Jesus said in the Gospel of John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. The truth is this. No church, no person, no clergy, no anything only Jesus Christ is the truth. In him is the truth that will set us free. Whoever is set free by Jesus is set free indeed, the Bible tells us. So let's realize that the truth matters and Jesus is telling the church in Philadelphia, I'm the holy one, I'm the faithful one, I'm the true one, I hold the keys of David. Let's talk about this for a minute. The keys of David would have been to the throne of the king of David, which would have been established on the throne of Jerusalem. The Jews believed that the Messiah would rule an earthly rule on the king of David's throne. They didn't realize, they didn't see a suffering Messiah. 
They couldn't understand Isaiah 53 through 55 and seeing this Messiah that would give himself for his people and die for his people. In fact, even you see amongst the disciples, they were confused. They wanted Jesus to rise up with power, with a sword, and take over Jerusalem again and rule like King David. But Jesus is telling us here, I hold the keys. But the keys to the throne that I have is the new Jerusalem to come. It is to eternity. And anyone who comes to me will be a part of my kingdom. So if you're in here, people of God, in the moment you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, he is the one that holds the key to eternity. He is the one that can save your soul. He is the one that can establish you in his kingdom forever. And then he goes on to say, I'm the one that opens things and shut things. This is talking about opportunities. I want you to know this, that anything that Jesus opens, no human force can shut. Anything that he closes, no human force can open. Whatever Jesus determines to open, i.e. the missionary movement that spread our desire, his desire for us to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, that door God has opened and we need to make sure we keep taking the opportunities he gives us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. This church got that. This church saw an opportunity that God opened up to them and they took advantage of it. Lexington Park Baptist Church, God will give us opportunities. In your work, I dare you to pray that prayer I prayed earlier. God, show me someone I can invite. If you pray that prayer, guess what? I guarantee you God will do this week. He will show somebody to you. Now, you may not invite them. You may say, no, that, that can't be. I, who, why would God want that person in church with me? Maybe they don't want to sit with you. If God gives you an opportunity, you need to take it. If that door opens, you need to walk through it. And you guys know that little cliche, if he closes the door, look for a window, right? It might be open. God will open things to us. He opened things to this church, and the greatest missionary movement emerged ever. The gospel has literally gone almost to every part of the earth. We just don't have enough missionaries. We've translated, listen, they translate uh, into almost every tongue they can. We have translators in Richmond, Virginia for the Southern Baptist Convention that are trying to translate the gospel in every dialect, in every region, of every language known on the face of the earth. That's pretty awesome. Wheaton College has a big movement in that too. That's where Billy Graham went to school. We need to make sure that we are a part of that, taking the gospel. And by the way, the good news is, I know some of us may have some Southern Maryland accent in here. Or some of my Kentucky hillbilly may come out, but you can still understand me. Amen? So we can share the gospel in our tongue and share it with each other as God gives us opportunity. Never cower away from that. So they're faithful to the gospel. They're faithful to the word of God. And Jesus reveals those things as his kingship and his authority are played out. As he says, if I'm open it, it's my authority. If I give you this commission to go to the ends of the world, it's by my authority that I've given it. You go in my name. Is there any other authority greater than Christ? No. Uncle Sam greater than Christ? No. No kingdom on this earth is greater than God's kingdom. No authority on this earth is greater than the authority of God. No power is greater. Listen, Baptists, we get a little scared about this. The Holy Spirit is the greatest power that's ever been unleashed on this earth. That dude from North Korea doing nuclear tests, that's nothing compared to the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can take a life and change it from within. The Holy Spirit can get a hold of your life and redeem you from sin. The Holy Spirit can get a hold of your life and guess what? Make you do things you never thought you'd ever do, like invite somebody to church. The Holy Spirit has that ability to do that. Never doubt his power, never question his authority. He is the greatest story, the greatest power on the earth. So now let's look at what Jesus says specifically to this church. First is this. He compliments them. They're an open door church. No, they're not. Yes, they are. Look right there. Look right there. He says, I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door. Wow. I met somebody this week. Their last name's Door. I can't say more than that. But said their husband always says they're like a door in front of them. You know what? When God opens a door, it opens. Amen? And when God opens a door of opportunity, we take it like I just preached. They're open door church. What should that mean to us? These walls, they don't exist. 
These doors, they don't exist. This is not a closed place. This is a place that's open to all generations, to all ethnicities, to all people that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, yeah. I sometimes don't believe the church means, means it. Our job is to be a church without walls. Our job is to understand that when we leave this place, we're at our best. Because when we leave this place, we're having like a pep rally right now, and we're going into the world to reach people for Jesus Christ. Yes, I mean that. I really do. I really want you all to start to get that too. Because you know how a church grows? Not just because the pastor, listen, me preaching a great sermon every week, they're not all great, but some of you come up, I love it, you'll say, hey, great sermon, pastor. If you do that today, guess what I'm going to do to you? Wednesday night, I'm going to ask you, what was so great about my sermon? And you're going to go. Can I pull my notes out? You know, so now all of you are going to like, okay, I better be prepared. I'm going to have an outline here. Open door, pastor, open door. Be an open door. We want people to come in, but we've got to go get them. The open door doesn't mean just open the sign and say, come on in. You've got to go get them. Jesus said, go be fisher of men. Go be fisher of people. Our job is to go out there and get them. Listen, you can sit in the boat all day long and say, fish, get in the boat. They're not going to get in the boat. You've got to go get them. And we have an open door. We love. We embrace each other. Listen, I have not seen this in four months. I don't think there are cliques here. There may be. But listen, if I see cliques, what do you think I'm going to do? Break them up. We don't do that. We receive all people. We open all people. We have open arms. When we do a greeting, you should purposely listen. There are people in this room I've not met. You should purposefully say, I've not met that person. I'm going to go meet them. You, should, you might say, I've seen that person here about five, six times. I ask them every week what their name is, and I can't remember. That's okay. Listen, when I don't do that, I go grab Fred, and I say, Fred, go find out what their name is, because I asked them last week, and I forgot. <laughs> and then Fred goes up and says, hey, what's your name? And then he writes it down and brings it to me, so then I can memorize it, see? Aha. Uh -huh. You can do the same thing. Open door. Be friendly. Who cares? If you have to ask somebody ten times, that's probably pretty bad. But who cares? Show them that you care and say, look, I know I'm a dirtbag. I forgot. I have a bad memory. You know, I know I'm not, I'm not, not that old, but I have junior moments, okay, everybody? I do. <laughs> and say, tell me your name again. You know? So make sure that you're reaching out, showing people that you care, that you notice them, that they're here. Be involved in their life. An open door church. He also says that he knows they have little strength. This is actually a compliment. Now, most of us would think, wait a minute, that's not a compliment. You know, for a church to say you have little strength. What Christ is saying here is because you're not of the world, the church may not look at you as strong. So back when I was growing up, if you were in the church, you were a goody two-shoe. Or you were a Jesus freak, or you were a Bible thumper, or you were a hypocrite if you weren't living right. Ever heard those things? Now today, the verbiage has changed. You're a bigot, you're a hater. You guys with me? All right, so if you stand for any truth, any moral truth, all right, you become labeled. All right, the world will always do that. The words hurt more now than they did in the past. If you live truthfully today, and you still have a biblical worldview, the world is not going to like you. The government doesn't like you right now. Even if they employ you, and you have a true Christian world ethic. Your ethic is not compatible with the world, and they will look at you as weak. They will look at you as wrong. Now, here's the good news. You're like, how can that be good? When we are weak, he is strong. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Christ will exalt the humble and humble the exalted. Right? So God is telling us we come to him in our weakness if we come to him and not thinking that we have superiority that he will lift us up and exalt us that he will be the one that gives us strength he will be the one that renews us and it's a compliment to know listen church of jesus christ it's about time we do something and i actually don't know that i've learned that until i moved here at broadman i, I did everything I was involved in everything, my hand was on everything, and, and, and things were successful. I, I, I managed to grow a church from 50 to 250, 
And that was great. But I was doing everything. There were people around me, but I was still involved in everything. A lot of that was on my own strength. You know what's been good here? Whatever I get my hand on here now is my own fault. Because it's your all's job. You're the body. And it's our job to say, Jesus, it's not by my strength, but by yours. So when we come here, there are great things we can do, and there are things we need to do. But we need to always remember it's by the power of of Christ. It's him who is our strength. It is him who will make us successful. It is him and for his glory alone that we do the things that we do. So let's remember that and the honor it came to the church of Philadelphia. It was a praise to them. He then applauds them beyond the strength that remains in them. He says that he has not found their works, excuse me, I'm in, not Sardis, we're down in Philadelphia. So a little power and you have kept my word and not denied my name. Church of Jesus Christ, if we're going to be successful, these are two things that you need to write down, you need to memorize, they need to be a part of your life. We cannot compromise the word of God, and we cannot deny the name of Jesus Christ. Any church that's going to thrive and be alive in our day and time needs to cling to those two things. Now, let's talk about that, because every church down the street that we would talk to would say, I believe in the Bible. And I believe in Jesus. Not all of them have the same Jesus. First of all, I'm not going to give names, but there are some people that talk about Jesus, but they don't talk to talk as he is divine, as in the Trinity. Any church that would deny the Trinity is not worshiping the true God of the Scriptures. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. They're three persons, but one essence. The word is homoousius in the Scriptures, and what that means is of the same substance. So God is fully in Jesus. God is fully in the Father. God is fully in the Spirit. Cannot, cannot comprehend it. You will not get your head around that fully, ever. That's an oak tree that you just need to say, I can't get my arms around. And I got some big ones in my front yard if you want to come try, okay? You just, some oak trees you just can't get your arms around. That's one of them. You need to grasp it, though. You need to get a hold of it. You need to believe in it. Somehow, the fullness of God is in the Father, Son, and Spirit. We need to worship the right God. We need to worship the right Christ. So we need to exalt Christ as Lord of lords and King of kings. Now, if Jesus is Lord, and he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands, then what should we do? Go ahead. What, what should we do? Keep his commands. Now, we're also supposed to lift up the word of God. All right, so let's stop. If the Bible says something our world doesn't like, does that mean our world is right or the word is right? All right, I'm glad you got that. So when you get out there and the world says, you're a bigot and a hater because you believe that God's just love. Look at my bobblehead Jesus in my front you know, window. See, all's life good. Just go get your Starbucks and be happy. If we do that, we've missed it. The word of God is changing. It's good for correction, rebuking. Boy, that's a harsh word. But the Bible says that. It's also good for edifying and encouraging. Praise Jesus. That's what we like, right? But it's not all sunshine. It's not all good stuff. Sometimes the word of God's supposed to hurt. Sometimes it's supposed to convict us deep within. And we're supposed to obey it. When the world tells us something that's different than the word, we need to be on our knees saying, God, I surrender to your word. I surrender to your character. I surrender to your intentions. I surrender to your purposes. We have too many churches that have failed to exalt Christ and failed to honor God's word. And we have too many Christians sitting in the pews that sit now, right now, and they disagree with what I've said. But Jesus said, if you're going to be like the church of Philadelphia, you will not deny my name. And you will not, listen, you will not fail to keep my word. So church of Jesus Christ, keeping the word of God, not denying his name are two of the greatest compliments Christ could ever say. There's something else he goes on to call them the true church. I'm not going to elaborate on that greatly. Remember, we're looking at a historical perspective. What he's saying is that from the Protestant Reformation would come the true church. Ouch. 
But from the Protestant Reformation would come the true church. Now why? He says there's this, this, this twice he's done this now in the letters. So you guys can go back and read it. I'm not doing anything different here. It says from the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews but they are not. They lie. Someday you will bow down and they will know that I have loved you. He also goes on to say here that he's going to protect us. He's going to, because you've kept my word, you've been patient. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming to the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. So look what Jesus is telling us is this. If, and you, know, you may have a different interpretation, but if you read of all of Revelation, you believe it has to do with eschatology, which is end times. Then what you have to see here is that what he's saying is there's a great tribulation that's coming someday. And oh, by the way, in a couple of chapters, he's going to start writing about it. You won't necessarily get out of all the pains of it and everything, but guess what? The great tribulation, this is a prelude to the rapture, that the church would be raptured prior to the great tribulation. Doesn't mean we're not going to go through trials. Doesn't mean we're not going to have tribulations. Doesn't mean the world's not going to get bad. And by the way, this is a fail excuse to anybody in here. If I ever hear somebody say, the world is so bad, who cares? Let's just let it go. Jesus never told us to do that either. No matter how bad it gets, we keep taking the gospel, the word of God, and the name of Jesus to the world. That's our job. We never give up. We never stop trying to make it better. Guess what? God may give us one last great awakening before he comes back. Wouldn't that be awesome? And it may be upon us. If a remnant of God's people are true and he can come bring revival and renewal and awakening, I want to see that if I can with my fleshly eyes, not only my spiritual eyes. I long to see that. How awesome if we could see a revival take place or an awakening across the land of America one more time. I don't give up, nor should you. Now, it may not happen. That's not an excuse for us not to try, amen? It's not an excuse for us to go ahead and just throw the baby in the bathwater out at the same time. We've got to stay true to God's gospel. All right, let's go on. Criticism, none. He says nothing bad about them. Never, ever, ever, ever. Philadelphia is faithful to his word and faithful to Jesus Christ, and he exalts them even in their weakness. And that's where we want to be. There's no criticism. Now, he does give some commands. Look at verse 11. He says, Behold, I'm coming soon. That's why I know this has a rep rapture or a second, uh, second uh, coming uh, context to it. So he's saying, I'm coming soon. So he says, Listen to what I want you to do. I want you to hold fast. Remember that roller coaster? No matter what ups and downs come in your Christian faith or in your walk, you hold on. Now, I know some of you don't like roller coasters, but sometimes life is like a roller coaster. Amen? Sometimes you want to throw up because you ate too much. Sometimes your head gets dizzy, right? Sometimes you don't want to get back on, but when it comes to the station, it's like, oh, nobody's in line. We're just going to keep you going. And you're stuck on it. Sometimes life is like that. God says, hold on. Just hold on to the things I've given you. And what does he tell them to hold on to? This is the theme of this one. My name and my word. Church of Jesus Christ. Everybody, you see, when I ask you Wednesday, you're going to know what to say. I'm holding on to the word in Jesus, Pastor. Hold on to the word. Hold on to Jesus. Hold on to those things and stay strong. And then he tells them this. There's a crown, a victorious crown that's waiting. Now, what he speaks of here would be like what we call our gold medals in the Olympics. Who watched the Olympics? Wasn't that awesome? I just posted yesterday on my Facebook this girl who's a wrestler. And she actually lost weight to compete in a faster and quicker wrestling category. Who knows why? The top person, the Japanese wrestler who had not been defeated in 12 years and she had lost twice to her she wanted to wrestle her one more time in the Olympics she wanted that gold medal she won on a decision four to one the first gold medal ever by a women wrestler in the United States and she was determined to face her opponent no matter what to train harder she learned Japanese why so she could understand what the coaches were yelling at the, the girl. So she would know what the coach was saying, do this or do that. So she would know what was coming. She trained harder. She trained longer. She gave everything she could to have that opportunity. And she became victorious. 
She had lost. In fact, the first season she ever wrestled, her record was 1 and 31. She was seven years old. She lost 30 times and didn't quit. Church of Jesus Christ. Christ says he has a crown that awaits for you. Whatever we have to do, if we have to learn Japanese, we learn Japanese. If we have to train harder, we train harder. If we have to get dirty on mats and do everything we can to share Jesus Christ with people, then we do it because there's a crown. And he says, don't let go of the crown. Don't let go of the prize that awaits you. You are victorious. Imagine that little girl, 1 in 31, growing up to beat the all-time champion and receive the first gold medal ever for a woman in the Olympics. If you didn't know what I just told you and you saw that today and saw that little girl, you would say she'd never grow up to be an Olympian. But she did. Because she believed in something greater than ourselves. We have Jesus. What's greater than that? We have the forgiveness of sins through the cross of Christ. We have been redeemed. We are free. We have eternal life. He holds the keys to the city of David. He is the one with all authority. We need to live victorious like we believe it. The last thing are the consequences he gives us. Two things here. One, he has a pillar, and he, has, he brands us by his name. So I want to talk just briefly about this. A pillar. Uh, we don't usually build houses by pr- pillars, but we know about foundations, right? Foundation goes bad, what happens? Joe, what happens? Building falls. It's not a good thing, right? You're a builder. Foundation's important. Pillars are important. They hold up things. Jesus is saying, those of you that keep my word and do not deny my name, you are a pillar in my temple. You're a pillar. You're firm. You're foundation. You're strong. Now, wait a minute. He just called them weak. But he calls them a pillar. A pillar is something that bears great weight, that will hold things up. Now, imagine this. If all of us are pillars, can we hold a lot of weight? If we all stand together, we can hold more up, right? The more of us that honor the name of Jesus and do not deny him, the more of us that hold true to the word of God, the stronger we are together as we become pillars of God. Everyone in here. Now the last name is being a name bearer. I'm going to go back to the 1980s. Jordash jeans. Come on, some of you laughing. You know, Calvin Klein. Yes, come on, some of you. If you didn't have that name brand on your butt, you were nothing. Right? <laughs> If you went into school and you didn't have Jordash on or you didn't have Calvin Klein or something like that, man, back in the 80s, you weren't hip, you weren't hot. And then who remembers parachute pants? Come on, some of you laughing, man. Had to have a pair of them parachute pants. A name matters. Now, it shouldn't when you're dealing with clothes. Who cares where you get your clothes for? Who cares what if you have a Levi's tag or you don't? If you have Nike or you don't, who cares? But with Jesus, you're his name bearer. And that's what he says here. Those of you that stay true to my name, stay true to my word, I'm going to place my name on you. I'm going to place my kingdom on you, the name of my city. And I'm going to place a new name, my new name on you for all eternity. Doesn't tell us what that name is. But everyone in here, if you are a child of God, you bear the name of God. The Bible calls it image bearer. The image of God is what we bear. When Christ comes into our lives, he makes us a new creation. It says, behold, the old is gone and the new has come and a work has begun in you and God will see it through to its completion. We have to believe that we bear the name of Christ. Now listen, sometimes we're going to embarrass him. I embarrass my parents, but my father always would tell me this, you're a McCombs. By the way, it's not McCombs, it's McCombs. Amen? I was out this week, and somebody called me McCombs again. I said, come on, really? Now, my secretary's got it down now. Amen, back there, Mary? It's McCombs. I bear that name with pride. My children, they may embarrass me sometimes. They're still a McCombs. You, you're still a child of the king. You're still a child of Christ. You still bear his name. And his kingdom, eternity, is written upon you for all who have bowed their knee to him and allegiance to him. So as we end this day, all that I'm speaking of, you can't even be a part of the church of Philadelphia until you do what? You bear his name. Until you become a pillar of Christ. Until you say, Christ, 
I bow my knee to you and to your kingdom alone. You are the greatest authority. Whatever you call me to do, I will do. You are Lord of lords and King of kings. Will you please save me from my sins so I can live for you? If you have never done that, somewhere like that, you are not a bearer of God's name. The greatest thing you could do is die in this earth to never bear his name. Make Jesus proud today. If you've never received him as your Lord and Savior today, will you come up and say, I want to bear his name? Will you come up here and talk to me or Joe or Nebel and say, I need Jesus in my life. I want to be a pillar for him. There may be others in here that need to make decisions towards baptism. Some of you have not been baptized. Some of you still are not members of this church. Maybe you need to become a pillar by joining the church today. Maybe you need to come up here today and there's something in your life. You know, listen, I am weak and I need God's strength in my life in this area. Joe or Nebel and I will pray with you, or you can just pray up here at the altar. So I want to encourage you, whatever God's laid upon your heart today, whether you're a guest, whether you're a home folk, whether you're somebody you're like, man, I'm a deacon, how could I come up here? People are going to think things bad about me. No, they're not. You come up as God leads you. You respond to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we close today, May you speak to our hearts. May you guide us. May you point us in the right direction. And Father God, I pray these consequences of being a pillar for you and being a name bearer for you will come true for everyone in this room. I pray that this church, our church, your church, right here, right now, in Lexington Park, will be true to your name, Jesus. And we will be true to your word. And that you will find us faithful. I pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.